So I will start by welcoming everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're joined by Rupert Brown today, the um, musician and co-founder of T-Minus. So he'll be talking through his Tinsus journey with us today um, and sharing hopefully some, <laughs> some tips and tricks um, that you've learned along the way. Um, so Rupert, we, I'll hand over to you. Do you just want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and your tinnitus journey? Sure, and I'd just like to thank, uh, firstly, the BTA, because um, I really uh, feel like that needs a big thank you, uh, not just for letting me appear today, but also for all the work you've done to help me and countless other people. So a massive thank you to you and the BTA and to David Stockdale and all the work you do, because it's fantastic. Um, my story sadly starts at the age of 22. So I've been a musician since the age of 11, and I, I, I felt that I was really rising up the ladder in a good way. I felt like I was good with people. I wasn't overly egotistical. I felt like I was beginning this wonderful journey. And I'd gone through to the National Youth Jazz Orchestra, uh, although I was in the B band, there were some much better drummers than me. And I got to Ronnie Scott. So at the age of 22, I managed to sort of um, get to one of those places I always wanted to get to and work with a, a world renowned musician called Roy Ayers. And I was about to go to America. I'd, I'd got his gig and I came off stage halfway through a three week um, stint there. And um, uh, it was just horrifying. I came off stage, there was the kind of ceremonial whooping and well done everyone, what a great gig. And I, I kind of was falsely smiling and I realized something so serious had happened to me. And um, in, in my left ear, I was pretty much deaf and something was strange, but I couldn't really understand it because A, I'd never known what this was and B, it's a very loud jazz club. So there's chinkings of glasses, people talking, laughing outside of the music being played. And um, I got outside and uh, I, I just nearly, I remember just nearly wanting to pass out and throwing up at the same time. I had eight sounds of tinnitus. I didn't really know what that was either. I'd seen, um, I think something like Born on the 4th of July, which was a um, Tom Cruise film. And I remember seeing films about war and there'd be a bomb or an explosion or, a gunshot and you would hear wouldn't you we still hear it in everything it is kind of kind of this flat line sound and which is always horrendous and they even tone it down in films because it's so bad I felt that at that time mine was sort of um way worse than that and also it was multiple so it was many sounds and to kind of um try and explain what it was like if you could all imagine so your Say, for example, I felt that I was on Bishop's Rock Lighthouse in the middle of this cold ocean and it was winter and there were crashing waves. There was a helicopter above my head. There was this sound of torrential wind and rain hitting my eardrums with the sound also of this kind of whirring and stirring and whooshing sound. And then high at the top of the lighthouse, it appeared in my mind that there was like um, these weird bells that you might get in a kind of a, a, um, a convent or a, a monastery but they weren't really in tone and they they kept moving around in a way that was very uncomfortable and the whole thing was so unsettling because there wasn't even a, a groove or a kind of rhythm to it it was always intermittent although the sound was constantly there it was horrible it was so destabilizing so that was my kind of um, foray into tinnitus suddenly at the age of 22 with, with no kind of uh, preparatory work done on the awareness of tinnitus. I suddenly became a, a, a person, a part of our community with tinnitus. Um, and I remember it was so bad. I remember um, writing on my uh, bedroom wall, um, which I would never do. I mean, I'm, I'm quite fussy about all this. I'll never write on anything. I wrote, please God, make this go away. It was just horrendous. And I, I felt like I, I couldn't help myself in any way. It was impossible. I had nothing there. I had no tools. So that was my first introduction to tinnitus, Maisie. Thanks very much for that, Rupert. And just out of interest, did you, when you experienced that, did it cross your mind to go and speak to a GP or was, did you just think, 
I'll just get on with it and hope it goes away or what was your thoughts around that? Well what I did was um, I was living in Thamesmead at the time in South London so there was a chemist um, um, up the road from there so I went straight into the chemist and just asked for any advice about noises in the head and he um, or she I can't remember said I think you might have tinnitus um, but I didn't have a computer so I couldn't work on it and he just gave me cotton wool um, which was probably even the worst thing so I finished the gig I still had halfway to go through the gig and I think that's probably what made it insurmountable was that I carried on but I don't like to give up so I, I, I was always going to carry on so I thought I was doing the best thing by having cotton wool but well, the cotton wool was just useless it doesn't do anything I really should have got earplugs and again I don't there's no blame game I don't blame them I don't blame GPs I don't blame any of those people that I was dealing with at the time because nobody really knew even now it's um you know we're, we're lucky if we can find you know a health professional that is um you know averse in dealing with tinnitus because it's a very very tricky subject area so yeah I had cotton wool um, and then the next thing I did was um, I went to the GP when I got back to the Isle of Wight because I needed to have some respite because I couldn't go to America. I, I couldn't contemplate traveling. I, I was really stuck. I, I had nowhere to go. I didn't really even like being out of the house because everything was really loud. My world had changed immeasurably. So I went to the GP and again I, I, I don't blame them but it was no good it was it, I had no information all I got was a book from my mother bless her um, which was this book that she left as I was convalescing in my bedroom and it basically was this um, horribly negative front cover which was a picture of a person in pain and agony with these sort of alarm bells next to uh, an alarm clock and that was this and I I couldn't face it, even though there was information in there, I could not face the idea of looking at this book. It was horrendous. And so I went to the GP, like I said, and I got a eight month, um, in eight months I got, was able to get a referral. So I remember going to the ENT and once again, it's, it is just the way it was. It was 30 years ago, but I was very unlucky. I, I, I went to this guy and I remember I was waiting in the waiting room and I was the last person at the end of the day. And um, I remember his door was half ajar. And I remember hearing him saying, he was on the phone to one of his buddies. And he said, I'll just get rid of this one and we'll get on the golf course. And I mean, I was waiting eight months. And in that eight months, there's so much now that we all know you can do in that eight months. You don't have to immediately have to wait and go and see an ENT first. There's, you know, we'll talk about that. There's many routes you can take. But so I went in there and the person said, um, yeah, OK, we've had your subsequent hearing tests. Everything checks out. You are deaf quite a lot in this one ear, but it may recover, which was one positive. But he said, yeah, you've got obviously clearly got very bad tinnitus, um, which is covering up some of those frequencies that are missing that are showing up in your um, hearing test. So do you mind if you never have to hear music again? And I, I was so confused. I wasn't angry I was shocked I, I mean I was just completely shocked I didn't understand what that meant not hearing music what so I can have a career in music as long as I don't hear music and he didn't really want to spend time with me so he wasn't interested in talking to me about that as a concept or what to work on and at that point I just felt just disgusted with not him but with the situation I wasn't blaming him I was just disgusted and um it was probably the best thing that could have happened to me actually Maisie because I realized quite quickly that it was just down to me alone I wasn't going to get absolutely any help from anybody mm. obviously come forward a little bit 30 years and it's a very different world we have a, a wonderful medical team that really care about patients with tinnitus part of the idea of working initially with um, Dr Baz Farage which is the great ENT consultant on the Isle of Wight. When I was doing the T-minus sound therapies, he wanted to be involved right from the beginning to advise. And uh, he would give me as much time as I wanted. And it was exactly <clears throat> in the same department as I was there 30 years ago, where I got this 
dreadful situation, I'm now plunged into this complete positivity of people that really do care about people. Mm. In the same way, we have this wonderful audiology department at the hospital run by um, uh, Susan Paul. And it's just, it's a whole different ball game of people, as you probably know, because you're hearing um, so many stories about success, about how you manage the tinnitus. And I think that's the thing. And from talking with um, the consultant and with audiology, it's like the bigger conversation now. And that's all I'm trying to do, apart from doing the sound therapy, what James, I and Silas and Simon are trying to do at T minus, obviously supporting you guys and doing what we can. But is to, in a sense, is to initiate the discussion between the medical world and the community. Mm. And that's really important because the community, quite rightly, don't feel that they are getting the right support and they're being passed from pillar to post and indeed the medical uh, community and establishment are finding it hard to have the conversation because sadly at the beginning once you've had your you know your hearing tests and maybe you haven't got a tumor and maybe you're, you're okay and to some degree and to some extent you're fairly well even though you might have tinnitus they're still having to send people out of the room kind of saying sorry there's nothing we can do about it. you'll have to get on with it but it's not like they're being cruel and that's the trouble it's how do we have that conversation so part of what i'm trying to work on at the moment is this kind of pre-state of um mindfulness it's like the idea that we need to treat people that are suffering from anguish and trauma so for example when you go to some of the tinnitus groups yours is very positive there are many that are very negative, um, the forums, not the groups. Um, mm -hmm. There's some wonderful tinnitus groups in this country, but some of them, they're allowed to run away with themselves. And it's all very well being able to vent. That's not a problem, but it's I, I'm all about trying to come up with a solution to a problem. And how do you do that? How do you manage that tinnitus problem? You know, I call it the tinnitus maze. You know, it's like the maze matrix of tinnitus. And, mm -hmm. and for, for me, to get to that habituation process is that pre-mindfulness stage, which is the idea that when we are prodding people, i.e. the medical establishment and vice versa, us as a tinnitus community are saying, why aren't you doing anything? What we have to address, I think, and what I realised part of the habituation process for me was addressing my feelings of denial, anger, the, the aspects of bargaining, which was, you know, why did this happen to me? Why has it happened to me? If I go down that road and that nail gun is going to get me like it did yesterday with the workers and the builders, does that set me back two months? There's all this kind of reckoning and bargaining that we do. Plus, we're feeling really low about ourselves at that time and we're so anxious. How do we get to that point of acceptance? Because when we're at that point of acceptance, then maybe we're able to handle all the other things that are around it. So maybe we can handle those big conversations and maybe also when we're trying to get positive discussion with the tinnitus groups, maybe we'll have more positivity. And it's not that they are to blame for their negativity, not at all. It's just that we have to have that discussion. So that's all I'm trying to do, Maisie, is have the discussion between yeah. every group. That's all I want to do. And then I'm going to walk away because I'm only doing this because I want to try and, and put something back because I realised that when I had really bad tinnitus, and I've had it three times really badly in my life, I mean, I still have it now, but it's it's fine. We're friends. You know, we've been friends for a long time only because of the habituation process. That saying, you know, I mean, you've got to get the right information. I would struggled for many, many, many years, even when I thought I'd habituated, which I had. Mm -hmm. So when I had the the really bad tinnitus 30 years ago with the eight sounds, I what I did was um I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was creating different colored white noises. I had three Toshiba Sanyo Yamaha tape players. They were like um, boogie boxes from the 1980s. And what I did was, Maisie, is that I pressed play, record, pause, and I turned up the volume and the tone. And each one of them had a different hiss sound. So tss, 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 they were different. So in a sense, it was creating white noise, pink noise, blue noise, or brown noise. They were colored white noises that had a Hertz frequency that my tinnitus quite enjoyed. So it was really homemade. And I wasn't getting anywhere until I made this uh, kind of discovery, which was 
well, OK, I'm I'm distracting myself. So that helps me because by distracting myself, I'm somehow taking the heat out of the situation, which is a good thing. So my anxiety is a bit less. OK, I can work with that. OK, that's fine. Ten percent less anxiety. Wicked. I'll work with that. The thing was, I noticed it really changed and suddenly the eight sounds dissipated over a year and became one when I turned it down. So I was having a competition with my own tinnitus. So I was saying to my brain, OK, you've got the tinnitus. Great. OK, I accept it's very, very poor, but let's weaponize it and let's do something else with it. Let's bring it lower than the tinnitus and see how that brain works. And it did. And I would do it at night time in the daytime. And it brought the sounds massively down, Maisie. So I ended up having different tape players in different rooms in my flat in London. And it really helped. So I didn't walk into a room where I was shocked at the sound of my tinnitus because my tinnitus was louder than any of my environments. You know, that's how we feel, you know. And I was reminded on this BBC documentary that we made with this wonderful guy called Tony, um, who was one of the people in the films who, who I was trying to help with his tinnitus. We spoke at the kitchen table in this film and it, it really took me back in time because he was saying, um, on a scale of one to 10, what's your tinnitus like? And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I remember doing that. And how many people probably remember doing that or are still doing it? I'm not saying it's good or bad, but that's just the situation that we happen to be in when we're in that space. Mine was way beyond 10, it was probably 15, 25 sometimes. Mm. Um, and he was saying, what's yours? And I, I, I still mean that at a push it's two, uh, you know, out of, out of 10, but that's just because I put the work in. I think if you put the work in Maisie mm. uh, with sound therapy and also the other disciplines, because even though I create sound therapy, I'm not going to, to sit here. I have to be authentic and say sound therapy does work, but it only works in conjunction with other management tools, which yeah. is great clinical information. That starts with you guys. That starts with the BTA. I mean, um, I should have brought it upstairs. Doc, Dr. Lawrence McKenna, I, I use lots of his manuscripts when I was starting out on my journey 30 years ago. And in 2008, I, I used the BTA. Um, they were fantastic. And Dr. David Bagley as well. I found that they'd written these papers. So I went through everything and it really helped. It really armed me. Again, I think sound therapy only works when you have information. So to start with, in terms of the habituation process, again, it's like it's a threefold pronged attack on tinnitus. You need information to start with you need to know that you're not dying you need to know that you're healthy to all intents and purposes you need to know that you have tinnitus but maybe there's nothing else underlying as a serious health condition mm -hmm. now what that does and what it did later on in 2008 i didn't get it the first time i stumbled across it so when it happened worse again with knife sharpening in my ears i realized that the information gave me an inner confidence. And it's a perverse word to use when you're struggling. But the confidence is a word that I would use because it grows. The confidence grows as you get more information. Secondly, I saw this amazing woman. Her name is called Penny Stannard. And she has a private health hearing company um, on the South Coast. She was incredible. I would equate her to a um oh she is like kind of like the female tinnitus equivalent of gandalf she's just a total uh, I, I i don't know how to explain it an, an amazing mm. person and she talked me through the process and I'm, i i remember talking to penny and she said when you turned up rupert you were broken um mm. and and indeed i was i i kind of had no strategy because it, it, you know, you, you can have tinnitus once and get over it. You can do it again, but every time you have something that happens, it's like you're starting over again. Yeah. So you have to relearn it and re go through the process. So with, with Penny's advice, what I was able to do was to work out noise exposure times, exposure to sound, sounds that would hurt me or not hurt me. What am I capable of dealing with? But again, 
amongst other things, wearing thicker rubber uh, soled shoes to help with the isolating of vibrations, particularly as a drummer or a musician. Things to look out for. Don't overcomplicate your auditory hearing system by putting earplugs in when you don't need them. Because I also had the complication of hyperacusis, which was a, a massive problem. Um, mm. If the tinnitus wasn't bad enough, the hyperacusis was really, really extraordinary. And I, I didn't realize that. However, I'm, 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 I'm okay with going through it. I, I see it now as something that I've learned massively from having these conditions. I, I, I don't regret it. I, I really don't. I've learned so much, Maisie. I, I, I can imagine. And just to let um, all the attendees know, if you've got any questions for Rupert, please feel free to submit those in the Q&A box at any point throughout these and we'll touch on those towards the end. Um, I just wanted to touch on really how how did you mentally get to the stage of, you mentioned that first kind of ENT appointment and hearing those words of how would you feel about not hearing music again? How did you get from that to okay, well, I've got to do something myself. Because I think a lot of the, the problem there is, is you hear that and you think, oh, well, it's going to be with me for the rest of my life. Like, how do I help myself? How, how did you mentally prepare yourself really to start that, that journey of habituation? I, I had this thing inside me and I, I don't know where it came from, but I, I visualised, I visualised myself being a Viking. So that's kind of what I was looking into. And it was a visualization. It was like a realization that came into me. I didn't have any choice over it. It was almost like something or somebody was protecting me and looking after me, um, like a, a higher energy. I don't know. I mean, I, mm. it, it was bizarre. And it was just this voice, um, which was my, my own voice deep inside saying, OK, well, what are you going to do about it? You've got to be incredibly practical. OK, so drink lots of water brilliant okay do not succumb to um because the doctor originally sent me on a, an anxiety group and then quite rightly they offered me sleeping tablets which i didn't take um i did the anxiety group which is really interesting it wasn't what i wanted because that wasn't what i was suffering from anxiety was just the, the fuel on the fire of tinnitus and tinnitus mm -hmm. loves that but um what i did was i, I drank plenty of water and i went out so I bathed myself in natural sounds. That's what I did, actually. I wanted to get back in touch with my natural and unnatural world. And that it felt like I wasn't going to do it by being inside of my house, just being like this, thinking, well, I could sort of have, um, you know, I could sort of have times where, for example, I just want to obliterate myself and, you know, get absolutely stone drunk, you know, or do things like that. But I, I, um, I did enjoy two glasses of wine during that, quite large ones, um, for about a year. So I did, I did use um, that kind of process. But what I did was I tried to get, I'm quite healthy anyway, but I tried to get even more healthy. So mm. what I was doing is I wanted to get myself ready for the battle and for the challenge. So if I was healthy, then that meant I could take on the stress. I tried to make sure that I slept or, or I rested and I would walk in nature. So I would get used to bathing in it again. So I would started at three o'clock in the morning because everything changed. You're in you're in kind of um, danger, flight or fight mode at this point. So you use whatever's available to you. So your sleep patterns have changed. Everything has changed. I would go out on when it was in Thames Mead in London, I would go out on the dual carriageway, which sounds crazy. But I wasn't losing my mind. I just knew that I had to get used to sound because sound was the thing that I felt destroyed me. But I also knew deep inside that sound was the thing that could heal me also. So I had to engage in that auditory world again. It was really important that I didn't refuse it because mm -hmm. I knew deep down that if I said no to all of it and I covered myself in cotton wool and I didn't go out and get dangerous again or do things that I felt were interesting to me and also a bit risky hearing wise, then I wasn't going to recover. You've got to recover your mind as much as your hearing. And in many ways, I think that's why we can't find a cure necessary. There isn't a blue or a red pill that's going to cure tinnitus, not in my lifetime. 
maybe i hope so but i'm not fussed with that because there's enough management around of tinnitus there's enough tools around where you can take your tinnitus down to an incredibly acceptable level where we don't need a cure i don't think i mean great if it comes up but i i don't think we need to look at that i think we need to look at managing tinnitus um mm -hmm. but that's what i did you know i bathed myself in natural sounds tried to keep well the next thing i did was i got back on my career so i had eight months off and then i thought stuff this i'm, I'm not giving up he is not going to tell me that i cannot do music so I, I got back and I started to do great work again. And I think as a result, my work as a musician is far better than it would have been had I not had tinnitus because I'm hearing things on a different level. So that's what happened. And I mean, even, you know, 30 years ago, if I go back a little bit to uh, 20 years ago, I was running a, a samba community band. I was also a teacher at a university teaching music, drums. And I had 113 people in this samba band, it's loads. And we would play every week, we would do carnivals and I would teach them rhythms. They're wonderful people. That's loud. I only had foam earplugs. So I knew that the work I was doing to myself was really effective because I wasn't fearing sound anymore. I was going out into that world and I was loving sound. I was happy that I was involved in it. So that's kind of the things that I did, Maisie. Yeah. Very positive no, affirmations. Yeah, they, they really are. I, I think, I'll be interested to know about so you mentioned um when the tinnitus came back so it, I imagine you had a had quite a few a few spikes throughout your journey how did you so when you expose yourself to these noise I, I imagine it was first uncomfortable and oh. painful yeah all of those things um yeah. well one thing I do now and it's probably the answer to your question in a sense i'm i looked into greek mythology because i think only when we really look at science and art coming together do we find that we can find a really um, successful management of tinnitus it's almost like those worlds don't collide i think the art world would collide but it, again we have to we have to come together as as friends and as people, as, as practitioners and as healers, we have to come back and we have to join up. And I looked into the idea of um, Chiron, um, the Greek mythological character, the wounded healer. And indeed, Carl Jung talks about this person, the idea of the, the healer being wounded, the wounded healer. And so for me, it's like, what I've been doing, thinking about all of that, because I'll, I'll think about these things for ages and I'll try and work with it. So I've been thinking about what athletes do, whereby, for example, if they want to strengthen their muscle, they tear it. And I'm not tearing my eardrum, I'm not doing anything like that. But in a sense, psychologically and on a kind of esoteric level, I'm tearing myself so I can heal stronger. So I'm actually creating more spikes deliberately at the moment. And you might think that's perverse, but I'm only doing it to myself. I'm not, I'm not, don't want anybody else to necessarily do that. That's my own experiment at the moment, but I'm doing it whilst doing these sessions at the moment, um, drum sessions and the work that I'm doing, I'm not wearing earplugs quite a lot of the time. And what I'm deliberately doing is I'm making the tinnitus worse. But the difference is I'm not reacting to it like I used to. So in the old days, I would have a tinnitus spike and it'd be, oh, my God, you know, mm -hmm. that's it. Right. Game over. I'm never going to do music. I am for all intents and purposes. I'm gone. Right. I'm lost now into the wilderness of tinnitus. I'm in the tinnitus maze. I can't get up. And those those um, that habituation process for me, I would just hear a nail gun down the street and I was kind of near it. That's two months completely, I would say all that lovely work I've done, which wasn't really any good work I had done, but it has all been undone. And mm. mentally I was defeated. So I had nothing in me. I had no gumption. I had no information, no confidence about what was happening to me. So now I know the processes. So yes, I have the spike. Yeah, yeah, it's really loud, but I'm not reacting to it in any way. And I understand the process. I know that the noise exposure is not dangerous. I know that the amount of time of the noise exposure is definitely not dangerous. 
I see it as therapeutic. It's, a, it's an interesting sound. And then I play with it. So I use my own sound therapy. I find that frequency that, that, I, that, I, that I work with and I play with my own tinnitus. I play with it, it's playtime. So I don't, I, don't, I don't worry about it. I'm not, I'm not freaked out by it. And so today when I'm talking to you, I don't even hear my tinnitus. I'm not saying it's gone. It's no. not, but I can't hear it. I can't hear it. And I've been doing music all week for this amazing artist, um, this incredible guy. I've been, I've been playing drums all week, recording for this uh, Netflix uh, program. So it's like, um, I'm okay with it. Uh, mm. I think it's how we react. The reaction is, is all important. It's how you react. How do you perceive it? Which is habituation, isn't it? It's the idea that we, perceive the tinnitus as either, as either being threatening or non-threatening to our, our auditory environment, really, isn't it? Of course, yeah. And I think, would you agree that the acceptance of the tinnitus is, you're kind of on en route to the habituation journey then? Do you think someone has to accept their tinnitus before they can habituate? And I, and I appreciate tinnitus is very different for everyone, but I think, if someone's in denial about it or become more anxious and worried about it, would do you think that holds them back a little bit from starting that that process of habituating? A great question, Maisie. Absolutely right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the acceptance is that's the waterfall. That's the the gold underneath the waterfall that we're all looking for, and it's mm -hmm. completely possible. It's there. It's not. It's not insurmountable. It's there for us to take and enjoy. The habituation is there and it can take any time. I think as, and really to say to people, you know, which is what you do at the BTA, which is just incredible, is that you are basically saying you are not alone. Mm -hmm. And that's a great starting point to know that other people are. I don't we do use the word suffer. I'm not against it, but, I, you know, ha, having trouble with their tinnitus. You know, we, we, mm -hmm. we all do from time to time, but we're not alone. And yeah, that's the beginning to know that you are, you have help and yeah. acceptance, but it's a long route, which is why I'm trying to, to devise this scheme through maybe meditation. We're working on it at the moment um, to put on our T-minus app is this journey to being actually, I mean, I call it, well, you know, for example, it, it's fine having mindfulness. Yes, it, it's brilliant, but for me, that wasn't the answer to be suddenly plunged into troublesome tinnitus and say, right, I'm going to do yoga now and I'm going to feel really relaxed. No, I'm not. I don't feel relaxed. I, I feel the opposite. I was doing badminton. I mean, I was doing that four times a week because I needed to shed some anger. I needed yeah. to express myself. Um, and I can do that with music, but sometimes physical expression is incredibly important. So you know, the idea at the end of this, um, you know, this early stage of pre-mindfulness is the idea that, you know, acceptance, or you could say, or in the way I'm phrasing it, is learning to be okay. Because I used to write notes in my diary, and I'm sure everybody does. We don't write that we've ever had a great day of tinnitus. I mean, I've, I, I went through all of my books, because I, I don't write, or I didn't write loads of, of things. I would just write... A smiley face or a couple of phrases but you know I never wrote tinnitus is great I've had a great day mm. forget it I would probably write ears bad with a very sad face and a tear coming from it so that's fine which I can learn from because I could see well again as part of the habituation process what's working what's different today did I have that extra coffee no stuff it I love coffee that made me happy good right I'll tick that off that's fine but, ah, I get it. Yes, there was some pressure. I felt something from something in my job. Maybe I had a big gig and I was a bit worried that my ears couldn't handle it. Right. That's why I had the spike today. Good. I know. But what I found that what I would write is if it was really great day, I'd write, OK. And it was like, wow, that felt brilliant. So mm -hmm. my feeling is what I'm trying to work on with this um, with these meditations and with these new sound therapies, the idea of getting people to a place where they are okay. And that's a nice word. I, I saw a thing on Instagram the other day, which was, um, it wasn't to do with tinnitus or anything, but it was the opposite of that. And 
I, I wasn't against it, but it, it made me think about it because the kind of the vibe was it's not okay to be not okay or something. And I thought, why would that be? Why would you write that? It's the same thing of, you know, when you have anxiety with tinnitus and you have panic attacks, what I realized when I first had that whole experience was that I realized very quickly and I stopped all of that from happening because I was looking at fear. And so what was the idea of panic? And the panic is just the fear of fear itself. So, and then I would chuckle and I think, right, okay, I don't need to ever have panic attacks again because what am I fearful of? I'm just afraid of being afraid. Well, if I'm, why am I preempting being afraid if I'm not actually afraid at this point? So, right, let's jettison that negativity. And this is that kind of whole thing. It's like um, the thing that was really important was speaking and supporting the BTA when we were doing the raising of, of the awareness of tinnitus during the, uh, the BTA tinnitus week, you know, um, was the idea of, um, you know, the COVID and then the idea that there may be a kind of um, an avalanche of tinnitus as a result of that. Now, I'm, I wasn't disputing um, the idea that you would have um, an infection or a virus, but for what I was really, because people are concerning themselves with that, that's fine. My, my kind of concern is more actually the negative messaging of you know staying at home and doing those things but the idea that okay so you stay at home and you're doing all those things but in a sense you can do all those things but you don't have to do it in a way where it's negative there's no solution to that that's just fear and that's actually not acceptable so what i'm trying to do also is to try and steer away from that as a as a as a format for controlling people because people will do what they are not told to do, but advised to do, because we are great people. Humanity is really, really important. We are going to do our best for people. We're going to show kindness, gratitude, and we're going to have a deep feeling of love for one another and help each other. So let's do that. The idea of, I'm not political, so I'm not trying to you know, criticize people. I'm just saying messaging is negative and it doesn't have to be. So we're going to have a massive issue. So what I'm trying to think about and trying to correct myself and get myself ready and prepared to help um, is to have the conversation about how do we help people now that are anxious and they have tinnitus as a result of the anxiety. Mm. So what do we do to help them? Because there's going to be a whole gamut of people that are dealing with that habituation yet again. So how do we show kindness in the right place? I think it's people like yourselves, these fantastic organizations that are around the world, Australian tinnitus, American tinnitus, France, we all, we all have to come together and help one another and, and really help in that discussion about supporting those people through that next stage, because mm -hmm. that is going to be really catastrophic. And that's yes. something there'll be papers written on that for years and years to come. How do we help these people when we come out of the lockdown? Because Initially, you probably felt the same thing. So looking at the, the feeling that we had with the tinnitus community um, was that, you know, to start with, it was quite pleasant. You know, the, the lack of um, oral stimulus and the stimulating effects of traffic and noise and pollution and aeroplanes was great to start with. But actually, you know, we've, we've, we've known that once that dissipation of that feeling of elation of quiet, I knew and you knew, everybody knew with tinnitus that, oh my word, you know, what is going to happen next? Because once you kind of get over that kind of feeling of, yeah, okay, there's no sound, what happens then? You've then got isolation and isolation is an absolute no-no, isn't it? It's a, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to help those people coming out of isolation. How do we help them? So again, part of the discussion like we're having is to try and really help people become aware of that situation coming out of uh, of, uh, of our lockdown, you know. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I, I think with the, just touching back on the, the acceptance part, I think a lot of people, especially if they're new to tinnitus is, well, I don't want it. So why should I accept it? So it like, and a lot of people say, oh, it's, um, and you've said it, it, it's my friend, it's a companion. Um, but people are like, yeah, but I don't want it as a friend. I want it to just go away. But I think, it, it's getting over that um, initial kind of hurdle, isn't it? And changing your mindset about how you feel and uh, about your tinnitus. Um, 
I'm just going, we've got quite a few questions, so I'm, I'm happy oh, to jump into these if you are, Rupert. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so um, Clive's asked, you used the word habituation, exactly what does this mean to you and did you achieve it <clears throat> by deliberate actions or did you just habituate over time? Uh, it was deliberate actions. Uh, and to start with, I habituated over time because I didn't know anything about habituation. I, I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. So it was essentially sound therapy that that helped me. But again, it wasn't it, the habituation wasn't full and complete. And which is why I had it again, even worse in 2008, mm -hmm. because I buried it. It was like a monster that I didn't let out. And that's something that we don't do, which is why this is brilliant. We're talking. A lot of people don't want to talk about it too much because mm -hmm. you're letting the monster out. And actually, we have to let that monster out. We have to be friends with ourselves, but we have to be friends with that monster. If we're not friendly with it, it's going to come back and it's going to hurt us later on in life. Or we're going to always have that fear. A bit like that great science fiction movie, The Forbidden Planet where the whole idea was that there was this electronic kind of um, creature that they'd created through negative, fearful vibrations. And I remember that as a kid. And again, that was what I used as an experience, um, which was the idea that I created this monster. Um, although it was through hearing accident, I nonetheless, I kept it there. I, 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 I gave it space. I gave it an energy. And by talking about it and by um, acknowledging it fully the next time round, the monster piece by piece became more docile. It was something that I could pat on the head and eventually I could send it out into the forest. And maybe it wanted to come back just to sleep in a little, little nice little space that I'd had next to my bed or something. And it's fine and it can stay there and we'll be friends and we'll use each other. So I use my friend as a way of being able to tell me as a barometer if I'm too stressed or have I not had enough water or have I had too many coffees? Have I had too much fun? Great, it won't ever be there if I've had too much fun. It's lovely. Happiness, <laughs> tinnitus hates happiness. <laughs> you know, it loves sadness. It dwells on melancholy and I am quite melancholy, strange enough, but that's because I like, you know, really pensive, serious, dark sounding jazz music. I love all of that. So, you know, tinnitus was always going to, in some ways, it was always going to find me. I think I was one of those people, but mm. it, it doesn't find me anymore. It's like with the sound therapy, as Penny Stannard once said, it's like um, you create a cave of sound that you've made and your tinnitus can't find you in it. And that's kind of how I feel. So I use visualization and I use all of those techniques. But the most important thing, Maisie, in a nutshell, is I talk about it and I acknowledge the monster and I and I am fully accepting of it. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think so. I think that gives a really good um a, a good overview of, of that. And like you say, a lot of people don't like talking about it, and rightly so, if if it doesn't, if they don't feel like they can really vent and kind of get their point across because I, I suppose with some people if they talk about it it triggers the tinnitus for them we've had it with events um where people have said I don't want to even just talking about it me and you it might maybe trigger them for some other people so no I think that's really um useful someone's um made a good point on how do you manage as well as tinnitus you mentioned you've got um hyperacusis how do you manage both of those especially and they said it's amazing that you can play drums with this how how do you manage that well to start with it was a nightmare uh, i mean i didn't manage it i would um um I, I remember when i first had the hyperacusis a postman would knock on the door and i'd be in tears not because i was sad it was just a reaction it was just overwhelming sound was hurting me and i'd run up my stairs and and just hide because it just hurt and that set me back another month just something innocuous like a a knock on the door so what I did was um, I carried on working so I'd work at a wonderful studio called Toe Rag Studios it's where they recorded the White Stripes record with a, a genius producer Liam Watson and I'd go there they knew my situation so they were fully supportive which that's the difference so I was talking to them they were talking so we'd alleviated extra stress that I didn't need but I had to go on a 
a boat which was noisy so i had earplugs vibrations forget it a train oh my god forget it you know uh people coming in and out of the toilets that sound on the train it's just it's like an explosion of water it was a nightmare then what made it worse was it was in hackney so i'd have to go on a tube train oh god and then i'd go on an overground train and then i'm doing the session while i'm doing drums the thing was it felt like i was in the gladiatorial arena it was so stressful and mm -hmm. What I what I did was, though, is the journey back was full of elation because this is this is part of really getting to that, which is do those things. Do not stop any of those things that you enjoy doing, even though it's difficult. Do not dare stop them. Keep the idea that you are going to be fine again because you will be. There's no question about it and that you are seeking happiness and those things again develop this inner confidence, the confidence, the feeling, even if my tennis was a bit worse, because I knew that I haven't done any damage. The feeling I got when I was taking the train back from London was just incredible. It's like, my God, I'm doing this. Nobody said I could do this. I don't, never thought it was possible. That becomes a lot easier later on, when, again, when you have the information. Hyperacusis is quite quite a tricky one but it's not it's not difficult to to lose i didn't think the third time round i had it which was again really bad i got rid of the hyperacusis really quick from going to see penny stanard this great woman and again she gave me the information she gave me the instructions i also read articles from the bta i phoned up this amazing woman i'd like to track her down one day she ran the helpline at the bta and i remember only phoning it three times in the space of about three months and the information she gave me was just flipping mind-blowing it was positive it wasn't lies she was genuine and she basically in a nutshell but she was so kind in the same way that penny and other people have been towards me is that they reassured me that makes all the difference because it's clinical reassurance it's not just somebody that uh, is saying, yeah, you'll be fine, you know, like um, a doctor. And again, it's not the doctor's fault. You know, they don't want to say you're not going to be fine. Or so some might say, yeah, you'll be fine. They might have just a, a nice bedside manner, you know, so you'll be fine. But no, these people would say you'll be fine. But this is the reason why you'll be fine. As long as you have the reason and you have the idea that you know what you're up against. Again, it's finding the keys to get out of that tinnitus maze. Once you're in the maze, it's so hard to get out of it unless you get great clinical information and wonderful sound therapy. So that's that, that in a sense is how I really truly um, managed to get out of that situation, out of hyperacusis was by also letting sound in. So earplugs are very important for cafes, restaurants, loud concerts, playing music so I wear them I wear um, the a really good ACS um, uh, earplugs so I use the 15s or I use um, something a bit lighter or I use 25s so I've always had them I've got loads of them I've got about seven different pairs of things um, and then I bathe myself in noise generators which we create so if, if, if it were something from pure tone or our own app you know the t minus app would use that i'd use that so i was i was bathing in sounds all the time making sure i was um, nurturing myself and nourishing myself in sound and allowing sound in so where i was going wrong what makes hypercussis worse is if you go out with um big ear defenders mm -hmm. i've still got them I, I i won't get them but they're over there i, <laughs> I keep all these things as a reference to what i was <laughs> like so big big ear defenders from like, you know, a, a, you know, a DIY shop. I would go out driving with them and earplugs. Well, that's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? I mean, crikey, obviously sound is going to affect me then because if I take them off, then it's going to be a nightmare because I'm not in that natural and unnatural, lovely world of sound. Mm. But, you know, earplugs for when you really need them, but for a lot of the time, make sure that you are letting beautiful sound in and enjoy the nourishment of those sounds. We were talking earlier about urban uh, life as opposed to rural life. Now, 
I, it's perfect for me, a song with tinnitus. I live in a town by the ocean. So it's hustle and bustle. And I have a little test. So my partner, uh, she finds the sound of the sirens really bad. I do, I, I must confess, I, I, don't, um, I don't like it. But I use it as a test, it's a barometer. I do not try and cover my ears because it's like, I know it's not gonna do any damage. I know it's almost therapeutic, so I allow it. And that's the thing. It's like I'm taking a bit like that film. I don't know how you would call it, like Predator, that uh, great film, that science fiction film, where that creature comes down and the first thing they do is they kind of getting involved with our natural and un our unnatural world. And I'm doing the same. So I'm taking it all in. I'm feeding it back into my brain and I'm kind of going good, bad, good, bad. Yeah, put it in there. Right. OK, I know what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. So my auditory world is everywhere. So this is how I still use sound therapy. This is why I created the different type of sound therapy that's very different. Is that the idea is that you use everything around you. So even if I haven't got my sound therapy with me, I'm in that world of sound therapy. I, I view my natural and unnatural world as being a world of sound. I'm mm -hmm. not ignoring it. I mean, how many times do we walk in London or an urban area, and wh why don't we look into the sky? Why don't we do that? It's like our awareness has somehow diminished. So we've got to take in everything. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't regret ever having tinnitus because my awareness has changed. I feel very different. I, I feel like I'm living in this world now, whereas before I wasn't. I wasn't mm -hmm. taking anything in. I wasn't bathing in the beautiful sounds. And things that aren't beautiful are still really interesting to listen to. So it's the way that I react to sound. And again, as a deeper rule, that also is part of how we accept it and how do we move out of the hyperacusis. By burying ourselves in the sand and not letting sound in, we're creating hyperacusis that will last forever. And it doesn't have to last forever. It can actually finish today. And I mean that if we get that right, it will finish as when we want it to. We can control the hyperacusis I think much easier than we can with the tinnitus. That's something else, but I think the hyperacusis and they are inextricably linked, I feel. It was in my case. Hmm. Tinnitus and hyperacusis were very much linked. Great. That, that that's great. Um, um a lot of questions have come through about um T minus, because obviously that I know that we touched on it a bit would you be able to give kind of an, an overview um, and someone has asked when it will be available on android um so if you yeah if you could just maybe provide a bit more information about the app whilst you do do that sorry um Rupert, i'm just going to quickly run a poll just it's two questions it will appear on your screen um it's just about today's webinar um so you should see that now but whilst that's launched there, Rupert. Um, yeah, please let us know a, a little bit more about the, the T minus app. Well, so the idea being was that what I did was I traveled to find sound. So I used it for myself to start with. Mm. And what I did was I put everything together. The idea was that I used environmental sounds to start with because that was far easier to work on. So those were my sounds that were around me and I traveled to lots of countries to get those sounds. The next thing was the unnatural world, which was urban life. So the idea of having tube trains, airports, places that I feared, certainly for hyperacusis as well, were, were places that I wanted to re-engage with as a, as a sound tool. So the idea was to encapsulate that very simply into an app, to have all of these different, what I would call mind environments, weaponized sound therapy, so inside them, I've embedded tones that I know work for my eight different tinnitus sounds and for other members of the community that I've worked with whilst um, testing the app to start with before we released it. So inside there, you've also got the natural and unnatural sounds. And there's like a, it's like a maze that will help you get out of tinnitus through sound therapy, as long as you have all the other information. But the idea is that embedded in there is a weaponized sound therapy. So there are tones in there. A bit like, I would look at the app as being almost like a skin graft, an oral DNA skin, skin graft for your tinnitus, which is, I'm trying to find those sounds that you actually possess and have. I'm not trying to mask it. I'm not even trying to distract you. I want you to actually be able 
to find those sounds and like a skin graft it only really i felt worked for me really well and really effectively which is why it's different to anything else because you're finding exactly those same sounds that you possess and once you do that your tinnitus goes uh what what are you doing it starts to question the way it's hearing it and again, you only need that little bit of a spark to then work on, ah, okay, right. That tinnitus that I had is not able to find me president, pre presently. Therefore, it's looking somewhere else. It's going somewhere else. That's your starting point. That's what it worked on for me. That's how I discovered it by chance. I zoomed in and found my exact frequency. And once I did that, it was like going to absolute war with my tinnitus. It was a very, very different proposition. Mm -hmm. And I then, the important thing is to make it lower than that of your own tinnitus. And then you can do the work at nighttime. It doesn't have to be in the day. You can, your brain, you can allow it to do the work in the evening. Suddenly it comes down, down and down, and it brings your tinnitus right down. It takes time. Mm -hmm. You have to practice again there's no quick fixes with anything with the management of tinnitus or habituation but in that app contains all of those things that you really need to manage your tinnitus it also has colored white noises that you can find maybe that your tinnitus is in those even alone even without using the sound therapy mind environments or you have the hertz tones so maybe for you and your loved ones you're able to recognize your own sounds and let your family and loved ones know what is going on with your own tinnitus um, so that can be really quite mind-blowing and it can be really lovely the idea that you're giving them a pos positive gesture which is you're sharing your own sound with somebody can be so rewarding and and very emotional you know the idea that when I was able to show my um, loved ones what I was experiencing I, I think to start with they were absolutely shocked but it, it helped with the understanding and I think that's something, again, we need to work on is how do we involve the partners and the loved ones that they are part of the big story with managing tinnitus. But yeah, in our app, I've just found these incredible people, Simon and James Rodney, that run a, a small independent label and they invested. We're a private um, company um, and, and they, they have um, uh, hearing issues in the family. They wanted to get involved. They love the idea of supporting me. They love the idea. We will never make our money back, I shouldn't imagine. It's fine. <laughs> and we've decided to, because they knew that I'm passionate and I'm not going to leave it. So the investment they've made, I'm not just going to go away and say, well, that hasn't worked. Then, you know, it's not like that. It's lifelong. It's devotional. My career is my music. The Tinnitus app with James and Simon and Silas is devotional. It's a very different attitude. And they're in it for the long haul. And um, we found this incredible app developer called Andrew Fox, who just loved the idea also. So we've been so lucky. We haven't got an Android. We were going to work with this amazing woman called Deeksha, who's part of the Billionaires uh, campaign in India. Um, and we are going to work with Deeksha at some point. But we had um, a situation possibly lined up that they were going to help invest in the Android version. But when COVID-19 came, uh, came along, they were putting all of their money quite rightly into trying to find therapeutics. So the money went to try and help people with their own situation in the country and to help worldwide um, mm. with the wider uh, society. So, you know, our, our Android app, quite rightly, you know, forget that. There were, were other things going on. But we're either going to do a crowdfunding soon or we're going to see if we can try and get some investment. But yeah, we, we plow on with our iOS model. But the thing is what we're gonna have in, on our website as well is we're going to uh, be able to get a situation going where we'll have some sound therapy for people on there. It won't be the app, but, yes. um, or you can find it on Spotify or Apple if you just want the sound therapy. So that's in a sense uh, what the T-minus was all about was to create positive weaponized sound therapy. So you take nature, unnatural sounds, supernatural sounds, I, you put them together. There's a sleep series. We have the world's, I think, finest guided meditations that are really aimed at tinnitus specific uh, guided meditation therapy. Um, and there are lots of twists and turns. There's binaural music in there. So we've got everything and it's completely unique. And I, I like to think it's utterly original. I'm all about that. I, 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 when I do 
my sessions, I, I like to think that people ask me because they're getting something completely different. Mm. I'm not generic in any way. And um, I live and breathe music and originality and trying to come up with ideas that I think I'll be able to predict what I think the future will be and what people are looking for. Um, yeah. And that's part of what I am as an artist. That's part of my makeup. That's brilliant. I, and I honestly can't believe it's been an hour, Rupert. This has been so great. I'm very aware that there are lots of questions that came, uh, came in over that hour. Rupert, would you be um, happy for me to kind of send these questions over to you and you could maybe type up an answer, which I could send on to attendees? Um, yeah. Just so I, I think there's just a few questions around kind of what um, sound therapy and um, some other interesting topics which which you touched on in that hour so any further information on that would would be great so I'll send that on to people um, shortly but that does wrap today's session up um, and I just want to say a massive massive thank you Rupert it's been so useful and I hope everyone would agree it's been very positive um, outlook um, but yeah thank you very much for joining us it's a pleasure and um, good luck to everything that the BTA is doing and uh, yeah, you'll have our support, support for, for life. So really nice to, to do this. It's a real pleasure and to help the tinnitus community. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Rupert. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'll be in touch with um, materials and any follow up um, information. But for this now, is George. <laughs> He's little, oh, he's he knows um, it's time to finish. <laughs> he's a little foster cat. Yeah, we've only just got him for the last five days. He had lots of anxiety and uh, he's doing really well. As you can see, he's loving it. Uh, <laughs> hey, George, look at that. Yeah. Wow. He's famous. <laughs> Thanks lovely. so much, Rupert. And thank you everyone for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.